to make this is a suspended meeting from July the 21st, and um, we will adjourn at the end of the day. Um, we're here to hear from Tria, and after that presentation, I'll take a short recess, and then we're going to get an update on COVID, and that will be our agenda for the day. And uh, feel free to, to ask any questions you want to ask. Please just ask you to raise your hand and let me recognize you so we can keep some order. Ask as many and talk as long as you want to talk. Let's just have some over, please. So at this time, I'd ask Pastor Cameron to lead some prayer. And Mr. Mark, the Pledge of Allegiance. Father, another day that you bless us with to live. We thank you for it. We pray we would use it, bring you glory, give us discernment, give us wisdom, that we would do what's best. It's best for the residents of this county, it's best according to your will. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So this time, Trey, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairperson Peterson. Um, thank you, members of the Lane County Board of Commissioners, having Trillian here tonight to talk to you. I'd like to start out by introducing myself. My name is Cindy Ellers, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Clinical Services that Trillian provides in our current 26 counties. With me tonight presenting is Joy Futrell. She is our Executive Vice President of Administration and Finance. We'll be talk, doing the primary talking. I also wanted to introduce some colleagues, Dr. Michael Smith, who's our Chief Medical Officer. He's also available for any questions you may have of him. And General Counsel Richard Leisner, uh, right here to the rear of me, uh, also here tonight to answer any questions you may have of him. Uh, as we go through our presentation, again, we're happy to answer any questions about Trillium. Uh, we're a completely transparent organization and want to make sure that whatever your needs are, uh, we meet them tonight in terms of this presentation. So with that said, I'd like to just quickly go over the, a couple of things that are provided for you in the folder in front of you, uh, just to explain what they are. It's a collection of uh, different resources that we have available at Trillium. I'll be talking about some of these tonight. If they pique your interest, then it'll give you a little bit more information. So this is a, a door uh, hanger that Trillium has for one community program. Uh, Trillium does canvassing in targeted communities to try to reach out and do outreach to people who are in marginalized communities or who may not know how to access mental health or substance abuse services. Uh, and when they're not home, we leave this on their doorknob so they can get up with us. This is something we've started since the pandemic. As we know, there are higher rates of suicide, higher rates of substance use, and higher rates of mental health issues. Uh, so we've been doing canvassing in lots of our um, more economically deprived communities. Uh, Neighborhood Connections is another program we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, this is also an outreach program that helps people with food and housing and transportation and employment so that people can take charge of their lives and get uh, things moving in the right direction for them. Um, we can help with all of those types of resources. Then we have in, in your packet is a brochure on our military and veterans, how to access care, um, mental health first aid, which is a free training we provide to all of our community stakeholders. Uh, our primary groups that use this are departments of social services, health departments, and other agencies that are first responding to the folks that have mental health and substance use and developmental disabilities. Uh, we also do a lot of this with our school systems uh, to help teachers and principals and cafeteria workers know how to uh, identify children who have problems. Crisis intervention team, this is where we work together with law enforcement, sheriff's department, city police, um, to help folks understand how to deal with mental health and substance use out in the community. Uh, I know East Point has these, Access Point is a um, a way that pe people can do screenings. Now we have kiosks in our area, but we also do this with our neighborhood connection staff, with our one community staff. We'll do a screening with the person right when we interact with them to try to get them engaged in services. So we also do this on the ground, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then just some other resources around school violence, what we do with schools to help identify children who are at risk for school violence, uh, as well as our learning campus, which is an online uh, campus that's available to providers, community stakeholders, as well as our school systems to help teach people about mental illness, 
about addiction so that we can get ahead of the curve and try to prevent the, the illness from getting worse due to lack of treatment. So I just wanted to explain all those resources are available. There's a lot more, but that was probably enough to put in your packet for just tonight. So I'll go ahead and talk. I do want to uh, share that our, our CEO, Lisa Wainwright, was not able to be here tonight just because of the short turnaround and other commitments that she already had. But on behalf of her and our board chair, Mary Ann Furness, uh, I just wanted to, again, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Um, Lisa does want me to convey that at any point when, when she has a little more time, she, she's happy to come back down here, talk as much as you want to, share as much as you need to about who Trillium is. So she just could not be here tonight just because of conflicts and the, the short turnaround time for us to get here. So part of, part of what we wanted to share, just to give you an idea of, um, we have this handout, this presentation that's up on the screen in your packet as well, there's some other information about Trillium. Um, we wanted to show you sort of what our representation is. Uh, while it is true we cover 26 counties from the Virginia line to the South Carolina border, uh, every single county gets unique catered services to them. Uh, we have a neighborhood connections group in every county, one community in every county, care coordinators for member care in every county. Um, our, our staff represent the culture of the county that they're working in and the diversity that exists there. Uh, every single one of our counties, you can call any county in the Trillium catchment area to ask them about us and they'll give you a good report about Trillium because they're getting their needs met. Um, so I just wanted to share sort of while we do look really big, we cater everything we do to the county level. We're very engaged with our counties. I'm going to talk a little bit about our board structure uh, towards the end tonight just to give you an idea of the way that folks can engage uh, with Trillium. Uh, to make sure that, that the county's needs are met, because that's what's important to us, uh, that every single county gets what their uh, constituents need. Just a, a little bit about our mission and, and uh, what we do at Trillium. Our goal is to transform lives of people that have mental illness, addiction, and intellectual or developmental disabilities. We do that by building community well-being. Um, you can't help people get better if you're not there to do it. Um, we do that with partnership with our county stakeholders, all of them, uh, and in larger cities like Wilmington with the, the city's um, resources, and, and we use proven solutions, evidence-based treatment practices, uh, and approaches that we know work to help people get better, while keeping an eye on making sure that we're a good steward of taxpayer dollars. Um, that is a really important thing as a public entity, as you well know, as a county. So our philosophy, um, some of the things I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, we believe that all people deserve easy access to high quality care. Uh, when you're talking about folks who have mental illness or addiction, they need to be able to get that care quickly uh, to be able to, and it needs to be a good quality of care so that they don't get worse. Um, and, and certainly in the case of addiction, end up overdosing or dying as a part of their condition. In the case of mental illness, ended up committing suicide or something along those lines because they didn't get the care that they needed. At Trillium, since 2007, when we began as an organization, we have practiced no wrong door. Uh, so if a person walks into a provider organization and that's the provider they chose, then they can get their treatment there. Uh, we do everything we can to execute a contract uh, with the provider so that the person can, can, again, get in that door and get seen. Um, clients, people in the community don't have to come to Trillium to start services. They can go straight to the provider and the provider can enroll them and begin treating them right away. Uh, this is true for all of our crisis services. People can access those directly. They don't have to go through Trillium uh, to get access to the care that they need. So if they know that Cindy is a great provider and she's working with Joy's daughter, then they can go straight there. They don't have to call and get routed by Trillium to that really great provider uh, or routed to some other provider they didn't choose. Uh, we work in partnership with our providers to deliver high quality care. Some of the things that we are able to do to make sure we have providers in all of our counties is really work to fund them adequately to be in some of our more rural counties that have less population. Um, a county neighboring you, Columbus, that has a really robust provider network today um, has that because we have worked with the funding 
to make that match up with the population uh, to more adequately serve that community. Um, our job at the end of the day is to meet the needs of your community and you will know that because people will not be calling you with those needs. Our commitment is to make sure that we're doing our job every single day. Um, that doesn't mean there'll never be bad days, right? That doesn't mean there'll never be a problem, but there'll be more days that we're doing our job and you're not hearing from this population than there will be days where people are upset not getting their needs met. Um, we pride ourselves on our track record about that and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because our track record speaks for us uh, when it comes to who we are and what we do in every single community that we serve. We do listen to our stakeholders and part of what you're gonna hear me talk about in just a minute with our service array came from our listening to members and families, listening to county government, both commissioners, de departments of social services directors, health directors, uh, departments of juvenile justice, the crime, JCPC committees, all of those collaboratives we sit on, we listen, we take the information back, we develop systems to meet those needs. Um, we do school-based therapy, for example, in every single school. There's 27 school districts in our current 26 counties, and we meet the mental health needs in those schools with school-based therapy to mitigate transportation problems. That came as a result of us listening to the school systems about what they needed for children. Um, so everything that we do, all of that, and what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, shows you who Trillium is. Uh, and again, we encourage you to call any of our counties and ask them, and they'll tell you the same about us. So just a little bit about our demographics. Um, our staff represent this sort of breakdown in each of our communities. Most of our uh, counties are rural, with the exception maybe of New Hanover, although parts of it are rural, as well as Pitt County. They're our most urban, but, but they are still very rural in some areas. But the vast majority of the 26 counties are rural counties, just like Layton. Um, our population today is 1.5 million across all those 26 counties. Uh, as I said, we're from the Virginia line down to South Carolina, all eastern counties. Um, as of July 1, when the standard plans, I'm sure you've heard about the standard plans, uh, come on board, we'll have 31,000 members uh, starting in just four days. Uh, but those are the members who have the most significant mental health, substance use, and intellectual and developmental disability needs that will be part of our population. They are, in fact, the people that we're serving today. Uh, the members that are leaving us and going to the standard plans are generally healthy people. So that really doesn't change much about what Trillium does. We're still serving the same people uh, that we've always served. We are used to counties that have a lot of poverty, uh, counties who uh, struggle financially, um, as we have 11 of the 40 most economically distressed counties in our catchment area. And for that reason, we are always pursuing lots of grants, lots of other opportunities for funding to bring money and resources into those communities. Um, when, it, when you don't have a lot of money, it requires you to get very creative. And what I'm gonna to explain to you uh, in a few minutes is how Trillium has become uh, really creative to meet the needs of all of our counties. We currently have a network of around 600 behavioral health and developmental disabilities providers uh, throughout our 26 counties and we already contract with all but three of the providers that are in Bladen County today. So those providers are already on our roster. They're already providers that we're working with in our 26 counties. We just need to add three providers to have all of the providers that are currently serving you. We won't stop there, but that's where we'll start. And we currently have 550 employees who live and work in Eastern North Carolina uh, in these communities that we serve. It is very important to Trillium that our staff live in the communities that they work in, so they're invested in the outcomes that happen in those communities. Uh, any employees who currently work for East Point that would want a job with Trillium will be, have that opportunity to be hired by Trillium and continue their work. Uh, so we wouldn't uh, expect to, to pick up Bladen County and not pick up those staff should they want to come work for Trillium. Um, just in terms of members, there are a total of 57,000 members that we serve each year. The vast majority of those individuals have mental health issues. Uh, then 12% have intellectual and developmental disabilities, and 13% have addiction. 
Um, currently, the innovations waiver, which is uh, the waiver that serves individuals who have intellectual disabilities, um, we have 1,835 of those members. I believe East Point has around um, 55 that are from Bladen County. And, and then we have 1,070 people on the waiting list. Uh, Trillium serves 67% of those, the highest in the state. So while people are waiting for this special waiver, we're still serving 67% of those people. And that is about three times as many people as any other LME in the state currently. And we do that through our creative uh, service delivery. So just to give you some additional aspects of, of who we are, uh, in 2015, uh, Coastal Care, which was the former program down in Wilmington, merged with ECBH. Uh, we were 19 counties, Coastal Care was five, and then we became the 26 counties that make up Trillium today. Um, in 2017, Nash County joined Trillium, and then in 2018, Columbus County joined Trillium. Trillium has never had a county leave us uh, for any reason, and, and that's an important distinction to make um, when we think about uh, the kinds of things that motivate counties to leave. We know throughout the state right now there are counties leaving uh, because they're not getting the services that they need and other LMEs, uh, and so we, we know that this is an important factor in the decision that county commissioners have to make. Uh, that's a statutory decision, it's yours, um, to make about making sure the needs of your constituents are met. When, when we think about this in going into the future, there has not been a time, I've, I've been doing this job for 25 years, uh, there has never been a more important decision for boards of county commissioners to make than right now, because in 2022, we will take over both the physical health care needs of this population as well as their behavioral health needs. So 100% of what that person gets will be funded by your LME MCO, which will then become a tailored plan in 2022. So it's not just about are they seeing a psychiatrist or that a group home or the day program, but it's also about their regular health care, their pharmacy benefits. And if the LME MCO then tailored plan that you choose doesn't do a stellar job, people will be harmed. So it's very important, this decision that is before you as a Board of County Commissioners is so important for the overall health and well-being of this population. It isn't one that you should make without all the information. Um, because people's lives, their insurance, you're making the decision who their insurance plan is going to be uh, for the, the years ahead. We make sure that people get the care that they need. Um, you know, there's lots of services and lots of growing needs, right? The needs are ever changing. The service system has to also be ever changing to meet those needs. Um, crisis services, you need a, a large array. We provide a large, large array of crisis services. Again, this idea of no wrong door access. So wherever a person shows up, they can get the help that they need. Um, one thing that is uh, unique about Trillium that we've been doing, again, since, since 2007, uh, is rapid access for substance use disorder. Uh, it's a get now, help now approach. So I don't know if any of you uh, know very much about substance use disorder, but when people have alcoholism or opioid addiction and they decide to get help, the window of opportunity is tiny. That they have to get in and get that help right away, because if they don't, they're just going to go back and use again. And so Trillium offers a rapid access to every single substance abuse service that we offer. There's no barrier for anyone to access that care right away. Every person that comes through a provider door or Trillium gets right in, right now, because we don't want them to say, oh, never mind, it was too hard, I'm just going to keep drinking. Oh, never mind, it was too hard, I'm just going to take some more pills or, or smoke some more whatever it may be that their drug of choice is, we want them to be able to get in right now so that they can get better. Um, when it comes to neighborhood connections, addressing housing and food and transportation, the reason this is so important to us and we've been doing it for years is because you cannot focus on getting better if you don't know where you're gonna to sleep tonight. You cannot focus on having good mental health if you're hungry. You can't think about anything but how hungry you are. Right? You can't think about anything but where am I going to sleep tonight. Never mind getting better. That can't happen if those basic needs aren't met. 
Many people can't get to care if they don't have transportation. And I'm not talking about transportation to Columbus County or Robeson County. I'm talking about transportation from Bladenboro to Elizabethtown, right? It's not that many miles unless you don't have a car. Then it might as well be a thousand, right? Because you can't get from one place to the other. So we work to find these kinds of solutions to support people to get the help they need. Again, that's our job. And if we're doing that job, you're not worrying about that happening for your people. One community is another uh, department that we just started in the last year. And this is really about helping with health disparities, targeting again those communities or neighborhoods where people aren't getting help, but we know there's a lot of people that need help. Sometimes law enforcement is how we know that because there's a lot of drug activity. Sometimes we know that because there's a lot of people from that neighborhood or that part of the, the county coming to the emergency room for help. And so we send out these staff to Canvas. We do awareness events in the community. We teach people about mental illness and addiction and developmental disabilities so we can get them to come in the door and get the help they need. Um, and we do that in a culturally competent way so that we're focusing on the, the parts of the community with people who understand that culture. Um, it, it's an important aspect of care. So I'm not going to read these slides to you. You have this in your packet. Um, but a couple of things I want to point out. Every LMEMCO in North Carolina has a set of basic benefits they're required to offer every Medicaid and, and indigent person. Uh, Trillium offers all of those basic enhanced benefits that are required by the Department of Health and Human Services. We're the only agency in the state that offers a, <clears throat> all the treatment services for addiction treatment specifically uh, with immediate priority access without any requirement for prior authorization. And this eliminates barriers. So all of the other LMEMCOs in the state require some prior authorization, some barrier for approval. We don't for addiction treatment. It's right in the door right now. Remember that get help now approach. It has been that way since 2007. Um, so all a person has to do in our catchment area is be willing to get help, and they get it. Um, we'll bring that to Bladen County. It's our commitment to Bladen County. In addition to that, uh, this array of services listed here are also services that we provide um, that are above and beyond uh, what is expected. And some of these, you know, some that are more common is medication-assisted therapy for people with opioids. We embed that in, in Columbus County, we embedded that in the health department. So where people were coming into the health department and screening, they just go right down this, this extra wing, which is where Port Health, one of our providers is, and they can get Suboxone or Buprenorphine prescribed and immediately start services. So straight from the health department, primary care, right down that other wing, if they choose to, to get help, it's available. Um, we've embedded co-responders with law enforcement, so we're sending out people who have, in white just right over the county line there, we have a co-responder with the RHA tied to the Whiteville City Police. It was a grant opportunity we offered. Uh, we did about $2 million in grants throughout the 26 counties. Not everybody applied, but a lot of people did to connect those, those mental health professionals with law enforcement or mental health professionals embedded in social services. So that, that when they were responding to people with these types of conditions, they had a trained mental health professional with them so we didn't expect the sheriff's deputy to be a mental health professional. We didn't expect the DSS person that's doing a custody order to become a therapist um, because that's not really their role. So these are just some examples. Oh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Okay. We, we're we've, lost connection. we've lost right. connection with Dr. Mondellins. Uh, okay. If we could, I don't know how that would be. I'm sorry. Well, I, I was just trying to get the chairman's attention. I know I'm engaging, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you see these lights go out, that means the phone's off. That's what that means. Is. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see everybody there. You're heading for a booster seat. <laughs> <laughs> Then you look. 
Ja, Can you move that closer to her? I don't think it's going to miss the ball. Well, well, that's, the she couldn't hear it because it was all. Okay. She should be able to hear it. Well, I'm going to close it real quick. You can just start all over. <laughs> <laughs> From the top. Right now. <laughs> part of the concern is what's going to be right here in Bladen County. So we got to assess that. What is it that you need right here in Bladen County? Um, we're willing to bring a comprehensive provider in here that's here, that the door is open all day, Monday through Friday, that has some after hours capacity um, to enhance, you know, mobile crisis around addiction, I'm specifically talking about, to get a medication assisted therapy provider right here in, the, in Elizabethtown uh, so folks don't have to travel out to, to wherever uh, to get that uh, service. Because again, we understand that the closer the treatment is to the person, the more likely they are to participate in it. The further they have to go, and a lot of times with limited resources, the less likely they are to get help that they need. That's true for anybody, right? The harder it is, the harder it is. Uh, whether that's taking off time for work or transportation or any number of issues. So we want to make it easy for people to get the help they need. Um, and, and as it relates to substance abuse, mental health, or developmental disabilities, we're going to make sure that that comes right here to your account. Um, so uh, that's this a little bit about substance use uh, and addiction services. Um, one thing I do want to point, point out just uh, is one thing that's coming online. I know you guys already do a lot with um, the, the program that is here uh, for residential beds. We would continue that commitment that you've already made. Uh, $50,000 a year to, to the residential program here for substance use. In addition to that, uh, we're going to be bringing online 200 beds in New Hanover County uh, that are sober living beds for people with addiction. It's an 18 month program. And so people are able to stay there for 18 months. If they choose to, we can't make them, but if they choose to, they can get that. Uh, it's an abstinence program uh, there in, in New Hanover County. It's under construction right now, plan to be launched in May of 22. Uh, so it offers an additional opportunity for folks. Um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities, Trillium offers the most services for IDD members in the state. Um, and as I said earlier, we offer uh, more people who are on that waiting list uh, than any other LMEMCO get served every year. Do the ID, IDD members, do they come qualify the school system or how do you so they come a lot of different ways. They come through the school system is one way as teachers or guidance counselors may refer them. They also get referred by their parents. And we also have a program, Family Navigator, which is the number one, one listed here, that does surveillance. And so what they do is um, when a person uh, is identified with an intellectual or developmental disability in a claim, so maybe the pediatrician feels like the young child is has autism. Um, the claim will come through when they file their claim and it'll say autism on it. And then we'll pick that up and call that mom or dad and say, we're Trillium. We understand your child has had an appointment for a well baby check and they looked, uh, the pediatrician told you they may have autism, what can we do to help? It's a family navigator calling, so that person is another mom or dad who has lived experience as a family member calling this new mom or dad that's just finding out their child has autism or Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or whatever. And so sometimes uh, it happens a lot of different ways, Commissioner Cogdell, uh, that we find these folks. Uh, sometimes it's because they know Easter Seals UCP, that's a common name Easter Seals is, and they just go straight to Easter Seals and start services right away. 
So any number of ways we identify that population. Uh, we have a lot of ways that we try to outreach to get that, uh, commute, that, that population into services. Because we know the sooner we can get them into services and care, the, the more relief their family is going to get and the more likely that child is to continue to live at home uh, in, in, with their parents. Um, we offer for that same population um, summer school uh, or summer day camps, uh, after school programs, uh, family weekend retreats that are things that help families li live, work, and play together so that um, families can learn techniques or ways to help manage their uh, child with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Um, one of the things we started this past year was doing small business grants to help this population um, if they wanted to create a lawn care business, right? We might buy the lawn more and weed eater and those types of things so they can get employed and have gainful uh, employment, make some money um, for, for their needs. Um, we help families plan for the future. And so one of the biggest things that happens uh, in, in lots of communities is our population is aging uh, and parents who are getting older in their 60s, 70s, 80s are having a hard time caring for their 40, 50, 60 year old children with developmental disabilities. And a lot of times those parents may not plan for their death and then all of a sudden DSS has an adult with developmental disabilities with nobody. And they've got to figure out what to do with this person. So we do a lot of outreach to try to make sure that there's uh, a will, that there's some kind of guardianship order, that we know who's going to take care of this person when mom and dad pass away so they don't end up um, at the DSS office trying to figure out what's going on. Um, so we, we've done a lot of planning with families around that. Uh, it's a special project that we target um, making sure that all of our older IDD members uh, have a plan. So when their mom and dad aren't here anymore, we know who's going to be the next one to, to take care of them. Another thing that's unique to Trillium, and we're the only LMNCO in the state that does, in this past year we spent over $1 million uh, in home and vehicle modifications uh, for people that, that have problems, uh, wouldn't have any other way of accessing uh, a wheelchair ramp, you know, so maybe their child's in a wheelchair or their adult family member company comes <coughs> and they need a wheelchair, we'll pay for that ramp to get on their home. There's not another public benefit that offers that assistance. There are a lot of churches that do do that for people. Uh, in a lot of communities, they ha there is that. We will modify someone's bathroom so that when they're in a wheelchair, they can get in the bathtub or shower uh, and have access to it. Um, we also buy special car seats. We'll put a wheelchair lift in somebody's van. Um, these are, again, extra benefits that only Trillium offers. But we do that because we know that most of the time, parents want their child to stay home. But it gets too hard to take care of them. They have no other choice but to put them in care somewhere. And so what we really try to do is have that child stay at home as long as, as that is feasible. But as parents are getting older, these kinds of accommodations can help them keep their loved one at home longer. Um, we put, I can't tell you how many fences in, around backyards for children with autism to keep them from wandering off, right? But that gives the child a chance to play in the backyard and be safe at the same time for the parents to have a place for them to go and know they can't, can't get out and run down the road and get lost. Uh, so we do, we do a lot of those kinds of things uh, to support this population. Um, for mental health, uh, for both children and adults, we, we do a lot of evidence-based treatment for this population, um, a lot of work in the community to help people know how to identify when someone may be suicidal. Uh, and we have a lot of suicide prevention uh, training that we do with, again, with schools and law enforcement and those other first responders are first line in our social services and DSSs uh, to try to get ahead of and prevent suicide, uh, but at the same time just to get the treatment uh, that people need to them. Uh, again, one of the things we do for children is school-based therapy to make sure that, and this is in partnership with the schools, we don't just tell the school we're going to bring therapy here, we work with the principal, we work with the administration, uh, the central office, uh, to make sure that everybody's in agreement, that everybody agrees on the provider, we engage those parties in um, proposals for procurement, so that they have a vested interest in who was chosen to deliver those services uh, in, in the case of mental health. Um, 
I know you all probably have some questions. I do, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, we do have a very targeted focus on the Department of Social Services and children that are involved in foster care uh, who are also in need of treatment uh, or their family is in need of treatment. We know throughout our counties, we hear from DSSs that with uh, drugs problems that are in there sometimes, DSS has to remove a child from their parents so the parent can get the treatment that they need. Um, at the same time, sometimes the child is who has the problems and so uh, we have all of the services for DSS involved youth are on a fast pass. That means they experience no barrier to accessing treatment from Trillium. Uh, they can get in and get that first episode of care. Um, again, we embedded clinicians with our departments of social services. Now, not every county applied to do that. Some didn't want it or didn't feel like they needed it, and that was okay. It's at the stakeholder's discretion. If you want it, it's there. If you don't, you don't have to do it. Um, because it really depends on the unique needs of that county, right? Um, but we did offer it to everybody. Um, again, we have uh, expedited access to things that keep families together and keep children in the home um, as much as possible. That's our goal. Uh, to help families be healthy so they can uh, manage the children. We have a close relationship with Boys and Girls Home right over here in Columbus County um, around some of the DSS involved youth. I'm sure y'all are, are familiar with them. Um, so all of these things go above and beyond what most LMEMCOs do. I've talked a little bit about neighborhood connections. I just want to share this graphic. It sort of shows that the member is at the center and then we have all these things in every community that wrap around it. And some of these things in some communities are stronger than other things. And so where we identify a gap, we work to build those kinds of things. The reason that this is so important here for Bladen County um, that I just want to touch on, and we talked about this in the other meeting I had, is the Department of, so of Health and Human Services uh, is going to receive $650 million in funding over the next several years for what's called Healthy Opportunity Grants. And what you hopefully have seen already is that Trillium is an innovator. We are creative. We do a lot that is above and beyond already uh, to meet the needs of our communities. So the Healthy Opportunities Grants were awarded a couple of weeks ago in the community care of the Lower Cape Fear, which covers Bladen County. Uh, as you see here, uh, it's Bladen, Brunswick, Columbus, New Hanover, Bronzeville, and Pender. I happen to be on the board of that uh, particular group, uh, they, they got awarded that and, and Bladen is in it. So there's an opportunity there for Bladen County to access uh, some of that $650 million to improve housing, to improve transportation, to improve food security, to improve uh, personal safety. That, that may include building new housing, which brings jobs to the community and those are always things uh, that, that every community needs. Uh, it may also include uh, innovative things we can't even think of right this minute. And so what is so exciting to Trillium about this is we are already an innovator and we want to bring more to help our people be healthy in our catchment area. And we would like Bladen to be a part of that. Uh, Bladen is in it either way, whether you stay with East Point or come with Trillium. Um, but we, we know that this is an opportunity that is in front of all of us to improve the health and well-being of, of people in this community. So I just wanted to point that out uh, as, as one of the areas. Uh, we have several counties, actually 14 I believe, 13 or 14 total uh, that are engaged in this. So it'll be a whole new department that will be developing a Trillium uh, to focus on healthy opportunities. Just because we have so many of them. Uh, and then I just wanted to talk about one community again. This is the, the part of Trillium that is working to improve access for people that aren't accessing services to clear up some health disparities, to improve health literacy, so that people really understand what a mental health problem looks like. What does addiction look like? Because sometimes people have these problems and they don't even know that that's what's wrong, right? They don't know because maybe they don't know anybody else that's like them that has those, those problems. A lot of times there are warning signs for suicide but people don't know that because they've never been around anybody that was suicidal. They don't know the questions to ask. And so this department really focuses on this in a culturally sensitive way to engage people. But we do that after we talk to our communities about what it is that the community wants. So if we came here, that would be one of the conversations we would have. So where do we need to target? What areas do we need to go in? 
you know, what is the biggest issue you see, and then we get at that work uh, to start resolving some of those problems in the community. <clears throat> I will just say, um, as we move into the Taylor Plan transition, that's supposed to start in uh, 2022, July, our standard plan partner is Carolina Complete Health. Um, they, they will be working along with us. Um, they are a partnership between the North Carolina Medical Society and the North Carolina Federally Qualified Health Clinics. We chose them because they already have a vested interest in the local communities. Through the Medical Society, those are the doctors that are right here now practicing in your community, uh, as well as the Federally Qualified Health Clinics. Uh, so we, we believe them to be the best partner we could choose for our standard plan partner as we move into the, the tailored plan, helping us get the physical health part right uh, for people. So I want to talk real quickly about the transition plan, and then I'm going to hand this off to my associate, Joy, who's going to talk about the money. Um, I'm sure you want to know about the money. So, um, and how it works. <laughs> So I want to just real quickly talk about a transition plan and what that would look like if you joined Trillium. Um, so first and foremost, stability and improved access in this community uh, and the people here is our primary goal. That is what is the most important thing is that there's stability in the system for your people. Um, any member that's already in services would have no disruption. Every authorization carries over, every service that they're getting keeps going, the providers stay intact while we add more providers to the array of providers and capacity here. Uh, so there wouldn't be any disruptions there for your people. Um, again, there's only three providers that we don't currently contract with that, that are contracted with East Point. We would hire the staff that currently work in this area a lot of times that's care coordinators or system of care, maybe regional training staff that you're already familiar with, any staff that are de de designated to serve in Bladen County. It would be their choice. They could come with us or stay with East Point. We wouldn't, uh, but we would offer them that opportunity. So wh whatever they would choose would be up to them. Um, the, then we get about assessing the gaps and starting filling those gaps that you've identified uh, in this community um, while we're also providing support uh, to the other community stakeholders to improve uh, access to services. Educating people how to get in, what you do. Um, one of the things we know that you're interested in in this community is a physical presence for Trillium. So just like we did in Columbus, they wanted an office. We have an office in Columbus County. We can do the same here if that is something that is your pleasure. It's not a problem for us to have a physical presence here. We will have staff here. They will be a place to work also. So that, that would be absolutely uh, a possibility if that's something you desire. Uh, for us to put on the ground here, uh, just so that people will know who we are and how to how to get through the door. Um, I just have one question before yep. we skip all that. Uh, what would be your vetting process for the? You're saying we would offer employment for the current employees. Mm -hmm. Would there be a vetting process, and they wouldn't be just automatic? They have to have references. I mean, we we have to check references and a clean background check. I mean, there's there's rules that have to be followed. Although, assuming they work for East Point, those same rules would be followed there, so we wouldn't expect to find any anomalies. That would be the only disqualifiers if they somehow had some kind of background record that would prohibit us employing them. I just can't even imagine that would be the case, though, given that they currently work for East Point and they have to follow the same rules we do. Does that, does that answer your question? I think so. For now. Okay. I think you're referencing the enthusiasm of care. Oh, that's more of that's kind of private. You know, well, I'm not trying to speak for you, but uh, um, I mean, and because I, I don't know what issues are long term, short term, because I'm fairly new. Um, but if the ball team's not playing well, hiring a new coach, keeping all the same players doesn't necessarily mean the ball team's going to get better. That's kind of what I was. What I meant, yeah. So I just, you know. Yep. So we would provide that employee every opportunity to improve their performance. Right, because that's the fair thing to do. Because sometimes it's maybe leadership, and maybe it's training. And so we would want to give people the opportunity to upskill and maintain the job. And if they weren't able to do that, then we think it would probably be a mutual party. Very well said. Okay. Timeline. So I know this is an important thing. Um, you might not be able to see this as good as I'd like for you to. So we're talking about a new way forward. 
in this particular engagement. Um, assuming that this decision would be made, we would start to engage along with you, uh, the North Carolina DHHS, around this decision. Um, if you made the decision to disengage from East Point, um, working to try to resolve those issues with them between now and the end of October, or beginning of October. October 1st, um, Trillium would, would look to have Blake County join us, um, stabilize again these existing services, do a marketing campaign to make sure that folks know who we are. That's billboards, that's text message, I mean, that's every way you can think of it. Uh, commercials, what, whatever it would take so that people in this community would know about us. Um, we would begin accessing those gaps in care starting in October to develop a plan that we can engage as you want to be in uh, to begin uh, getting those services in place um, that you may feel are not adequate at this time. And then, obviously, again, Healthy Opportunities starts coming online in the spring, so we want to be engaged in that process. Those evaluations that will be done uh, by that group to, to make sure that we're queued up to get whatever we can for Blaine County in, in that process. When we start into July of 22, so that's the first year, right? July of 22, so next year, this time, those things would all be taken care of and then we would be moving into the tailored plan operation. Again, assessing, making sure we got everything that you need, making sure our members are getting all the care that they need, making sure that we're meeting all the requirements the state has put forward for us while we continue to assess gaps. And so as we move over and start making physical health, we're gonna to have to make sure there's pediatricians, make sure that people are accessing all the health care for cancer, diabetes, blood pressure, you name it, whatever it is, all of that's on our plate. In, in 2023, so there may be new gaps that would emerge that we don't even know about today just being behavioral health and IDD. So as we're looking at that whole person, again, it's more gaps, it's filling those gaps. And as we get into 2024, now you've got a more robust service array than you have today, more care for these citizens in your county than you're experiencing right now. But we don't ever finish. We just keep a continuous improvement, continuously driving for better and better care for your community. So we don't ever find that place of we're finished, we're done, we've done it all. That place never comes because we're always striving to do better for people in what we do. This is what we wake up every day to do and we're passionate about it as you can tell, right? It's what we want to do and it is what we expect our employees to want to do when they come to work for Trillium. And so that's where the bar sits in our organization. Anything less than that isn't acceptable. And people generally won't stay because we're driven to get outcomes for, for our population. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Joy, and then after she finishes the finance, go answer every question you have. All right, so mine might not be as exciting and creative as Cindy's is, I am going to talk a little bit about the numbers, but it is important to understand that how the money works. I've been doing this for over 31 years. so. We, anytime we have additional money that we don't need to meet our budget or to meet our solvency standards, we're going to be reinvesting it in those services that you heard Cindy describe. And that's how we're able to do those innovative things. Understand how to fund it up front and then how to be able to sustain that long term for whatever service it is. Um, the majority of our huge reinvestments happen between 14 and 17, and in that time we reinvested over 36 million in our community. However, over the last two years, we've provided over 40 million in rate enhancements. And you might be saying, why does that matter? You gave providers a rate increase. Well, what's the big deal with that? And the big deal with that is two things. First of all, it's <coughs> provider stability in a year like we've been through. It's been really hard for providers to be able to make ends meet at times because people couldn't always come in and not everybody could do all those alternative things that might cost a little more. But more important than that, is those provider increases allow people to be able to access those services. So Cindy talked about mobile prices. By paying those providers the right rate, people could access mobile prices. Mobile prices could get to those people in a reasonable time. And, and why does that matter to you if, if it's not your family? It matters because you're paying law enforcement. So the quicker we can get those mobile prices providers out there to those members to resolve that situation, it's less time that your people in law enforcement and other groups like DSS are having to spend trying to resolve that issue. Um, next slide, please. 
current financial picture, um, we do regular reporting to our counties. We provide two reports to them. We've got one of the reports in the Manila folder that's in your package. So we show them, one, the number of people that have access services in their county, the value of services that they get. We provide that to counties twice a year, and then we send them a financial report um, twice a year. I'm sorry, four times a year, quarterly. County and ABC funds, we make sure that we reinvest those in your county, in your community, and we do that. So you heard Cindy talk about the crisis intervention training, the mental health first aid that's important to DSS and the school systems. You heard her talk about neighborhood connections. So those things are funded through your county dollars so that people are in your community, boots on the ground, serving the people in this community, and they see them. The lots on kits, we do all that through our county and other funds. At the end of May, our unrestricted fund balance and our Medicaid reserves was right at 18% of our budgeted amount. I'm sure you all who follow any of the local government commission rules, local government commission usually wants to see right at 15%, which is two months of operating expenses. So ours was over 18 on, at the end of May. And at the same time, that's in a year where we've targeted to spend 100% of our service funds. So each year, our goal with our funding is to focus both, as I said, any additional we have, we're going to be trying to do those one-time reinvestments that might fill a gap that's been identified, a new innovative way to do something, and obviously we want to do that while remaining financially sovereign at the same time. They're both important. Um, and so, next slide. Just to give you a little. We're talking about the green light. <laughs> oh, okay. I think we all green light. We all green light. <laughs> the green light said go. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> keep going. All right. Next slide, please. So, in the current year, so in your package, I've also included the budget message mm -hmm. and the budget mm -hmm. that we shared with our board that they approved just last week. Um, our budget for the July 1 of 22 is over 604 million, more than 89% of that budget, or about 528 million, is for services to members. About 38% of our administrative funds, so that's a little more than 17 million, is focused on individuals who have, who are hands-on with members. And by that, when I say hands-on, I mean those care coordinators who work in the community with people who are high risk and those people who pick up the phone when somebody calls, they, they do call us, they're trying to access a service or they're in an emergency situation. So 18 million, right at 18 million of our funding goes to support those <coughs> people. And then in next year's budget, we're reinvesting approximately 7 million to get ready to be a tailored plan. And that's important because we wanna make sure we're ready by July 1 of 22. And also, as we work with our standard plan partner, Carolina Complete, and our pharmacy partner, we want to make sure we can pull all of that data together so we're able to do that whole person care. That is the goal of being a tailored plan for our members. And like Cindy, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have if you want to know something else about our money. So the, the final thing, just to talk a little bit about the governing board structure at Trillium. So we have a, an alternative structure approved by DHHS this structure was approved when we became Trillium after our merger with Coastal Care in 2015. Um, this board structure is easily adaptable if a territory expands, for example, to add Bladen to our southern region of Trillium in the southern region. Uh, that's where Columbus got added when they joined us in 2018. Um, for the board, every, every county appoints two members to the Regional Advisory Board um, there are three regional boards, a northern region, a central region, and a southern region, uh, as we're currently structured today. Every county appoints two members, and then we also have three regional consumer and family advisory committees. And so the consumer and family advisory committee makes up the third appointee um, to the regional board. And so you can have um, our, our CFACs appoint a person to the regional board. One commissioner or designee um, and or and two members uh, are appointed from each board for a total of three members from the southern region move to our governing board which has 13 members and then one CFAC member 
So it's four members from the southern region on our governing board, right? Um, and so they, they, those, just like any uh, board, you know, people are nominated, the, the regional board votes, and then that's who uh, moves up into the governing board seats. And so then they serve terms and there's term limits and bylaws and that kind of thing around all of that. Our, our current board structure has 25% consumers and families, which is, is as it should be because these are the people that represent the people getting the services. Uh, our current board chair happens to actually be a consumer and family member, um, which also influences um, the, the way that we do business at Trillium. 25% uh, of the board is made up of county commissioners like yourselves, and then the other 50% are professionals that work in the field. So when you think about this going forward, it's important to have doctors and hospital administrators and those types of folks make up a board that is governing a health plan. And so that other 50% represent professionals in this field um, that would have influence on the, the health care and service delivery for the members. Uh, so that's a little bit about our, our board structure. Happy to share anything else about that. Um, there is a regional director for the Southern Region. Some of you met him when I came before Dennis Williams, is our th Southern Region uh, Regional Director. And the Regional Director is generally who works with the county managers uh, and, and presents to the county commissioners these reports that Joy was referencing. So with that, we're done, and we're happy to take any questions you have. Mr. Brooke, uh, ladies, um, I'm in retail and marketing letting people know where my business is, what my business is, what services I offer, and how well I perform is if I stay in business or not. Right. I've been a commissioner my fifth year. My first year here, I had to eat a bunch of pro sitting here with me, immediate and all, about mental health issues. It's embarrassing, and I'm just telling Mr. Peterson a while ago. As of today, I had two calls today needing alcohol treatment. Where do I go? What's available? And these were upstanding people, not that anybody's not worthy of it. And my point in mentioning this, whether we make a change or not, if we don't make a marketing aspect and have businesses that have something other than a storefront with hours on it and nobody there and you can call and you call and you still don't do that. And they're not there on the weekends either. And I don't know that we're any better off because I don't know where to send them. I don't know who to tell them to call. Mr. Martin might have got a call today if I referred mm -hmm. some stuff to him. But, um, Transparency and, and no commissioner here minds taking a call because I'm in retail. I get these calls all day, probably for a lot of these commissioners. I'm downtown, right? And that's fine. I accept that with my position. But at the same time, we need to be able to address the needs of our community and our citizens and the people that put us in this place. And without your help and your support and doing it the right way and making it visible and transparent, then we've not accomplished anything. We're not aiding to our people. And I don't know why people don't get that, that I believe I'd have it on every street corner and every billboard that became available so that people would know what is available, where it's at, where to go, and the services that are offered. And, because uh, I've not seen those changes in the last three years. Maybe some of them here have, but I have not, because I still get the call. And, and to me, that's that's seventy five percent of it. And I feel like you can do the services, but the people need to know where to go to get the services. And that's law enforcement and all. That's right. And um, because they don't know where to send the people, they're on the hospital board for, and and been out there and, and witness. What do we do with this person? Where do we take them to now? Uh, after they've been to the hospital. <coughs> Nobody's seen the boat. So, in fact, can just respond? Sure. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Um, we, we experienced that in Columbus and Nash um, in 2017 and 18. 
And it, it does take a full-on approach to marketing, to your point, uh, to, to really change the culture of the community, to make people aware, uh, to help people understand what to do and how to do it. And it takes having people in the community ready to bring them in and treat them. And, and they can't go to a door and the door is shut. Uh, that's that no wrong door approach. They got to go to the door and be able to get through it to the other side to get the help. And so our, our commitment is to make that happen. Uh, and we know how to do that. Our track record shows that. We've done it. Uh, my, my question is, and what I want to address, Mr. Britt has spoken about the same concern that I had. And I had the pleasure of this board appointing me to be on the East Point board. And over the years, I have tried to engage myself on what goes on to make help and move. And when I'm listening now to what you were saying, those services that you were asking and saying that you were providing, when I talk to other providers and other MCOs and other counties, I'm hearing the same thing that East Point says. This is exactly what you were saying. The service that they provide, a lot of it is the same thing. The type of services, the outreaches, and the different programs that East Point and Cardinal that got rooted out, and these guys have approached me. And I have had a conversation with some of the guys, the ones up around Forsyth County and different ones, and one down in Asheville. And they have talked about what service they have and how they provide service in the providers and MCOs. And I have tried to find out <coughs> and make a, some kind of, of decision, something on how MCOs work. And when I listen to MCOs, they all work along the same pattern, same idea, same concept. But the thing is, which one institutes the service. I call up the Columbus County where we got talking about creating and I've asked some people there about what creating does that people I know as providers. And I get the same answer from all of them. And, it's, and what I'm saying is we got issues with things we don't get. And some of them tell me they got the same issues that we have. So evidently some things are you know, people have the same feelings about how things go on and what kind of service they get. And what I'm trying to find, what is it that you would bring here that's different than MCO? I've heard you say everything you can bring, and I've heard all these guys talk about the same kind of programs. The thing is implementing the programs, providing the service. They all say the same thing when you ask them questions. So my thing is then, what's going to be distinctive enough that your MCO is going to change? That we can say, it's a major change coming down the road. What are you doing that's different? So I, I think, that's a great question, Mr. Cogdell. And I, I think that, so we all have the same contract with the state for Medicaid and state funds, right? It's how we use those contracts creatively to meet the needs of people. I don't know a lot about East Point. I haven't spent any time researching them or any other MCO for that matter. I can talk about what we do, and I can show you a track record of what we've done that's different in Columbus, and different in Nash, and different in, in our current catchment area, the 26 counties that we serve. Our counties are satisfied. They're not getting the phone calls that you're getting, right? They're not experiencing this at the degree you are, which calls you to invite us here. I, I can't, sort of counterpoint, what does East Point do, what does Truly do? I don't know that, because that's not the business I'm in, right? That's not the course of the Okay. I get around to. Okay. When I hear you make reference to providers, mm -hmm. providers provide the care. Absolutely. MCOs basically lay out the care. They don't provide it at all. They just lay it out and tell the providers what they need to do. Yes. And I'm trying to figure out, you just said we got 20 of the same M providers, in this county that uses premium right now. That our patients, right. those services, yeah, yeah, they go even, that he referred to keeping the same people, you can have the same people. Right. My thing is, what's the difference? Okay. You got the same 20 guys here. Yep. 
that's yes, going to happen to provide service. And it's one of those, this is, you, you keep doing the same thing, you get the same thing. All so right. what I'm asking, I do. how do you, okay. what are you going to do to so different? Right. So when, when we, I, I can give you this example, maybe it answers the question, maybe I can't answer the question, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, part of this goes to what Joy said about the way that we find, fund providers. So one of the chief complaints, and this is the only example I can use, that Columbus County had in 2018 was they did not have a comprehensive provider. They, like you, had a lot of storefront providers that were not there Monday through Friday, right? They were there Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or maybe two days a week, but people couldn't get in that door every day of the week. And when we came in, what we discovered was, one, the providers they had nobody was comprehensive nobody offered a full array of services they offered one thing or one thing but they didn't offer all the things that was one problem so we brought we did an rfp and we brought in port health port health is a large provider uh, that works with us in our other catchment areas they won the procurement um, from the providers that bid on that and there were several that were there that bid on it port was not a provider in columbus county at that time um, we worked with the county, they participated with us in that procurement, their health director did and, and one of the commissioners. Um, but what we did that was different is we funded them for the time that they sat there when nobody walked in the door. That is what was different. So that they could sustain the practice to be there when nobody was there. And so I'm sure Dr. Ellis as a doctor, you know, you can't have downtime as a doctor and make a living at it. And so if your funding source doesn't support that, and that's what Joy was talking about, so sometimes it's through rate increase, but sometimes it's through grants, whatever it takes. Today, Port Health operates a clinic adjacent to the health department five days a week from eight to five in Columbus County, and they can only do that because we supplement them financially for all of the no-shows or downtime or no appointment schedule they experience as a provider. Now, every provider doesn't have that because every provider isn't delivering a comprehensive clinic approach. So no, we don't do that with everyone. So you might hear some people who aren't happy because they're a little down on the money too because they're not having a much no-show as, as much funding or sessions. But we do that to get that full array, and that's what we will have to do in Bladen because your penetration is not high enough to sustain that kind of clinic. You don't have the population to sustain that kind of clinic, but it takes a spe special financial formula to make that viable in this community with this population. <laughs> we know how to do that. Ms. Futrell and I have been working together for 25 years making sure this kind of thing happens in rural communities like Bladen. That is what is different about us than other LMECOs. And we do that same model with mobile crisis. We fund it, and as Cindy described, as a firehouse model. So even then when there's not a fire, they're there and they are ready to respond. Well, I, 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 I said I won't say a whole lot down and off, but I thought you answered that in some of those unique things that you said that you did earlier in those that fire, PowerPoint presentation right there. Right, and that's I, I just had a question. Okay. Uh, um, for me, and I think Charles Ray talked about this at a meeting the other day, which you know, I know y'all were here about that, but I, you know, would like I almost kind of I guess what you want to call a, a, a statement or a promise that, you know, Bladen County being a big county, I think some of the concern about what we've heard in the past was all of our smaller areas, they're hard to get people there, Bladenboro, Carton, mm -hmm. East Arcadia. You know, all of those kind of, all of those kind of things. I know the other night, you know, our main concern was, you know, not, you know, not just putting a building in E-Town. Okay, we've done it. We've, right. We're here. You know, we've got to sign up. But also the fact that, you know, all these outlying areas and things like that would be addressed. And I know, I mean, I liked your pamphlets and the mobile. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, mobile clinic. We just did this in Perquimans County. In fact, for exactly the reason you're talking about, being able to reach areas that are hard to reach. And so this is our first one, not our last one. And so I think that's the way that you, so just like the driver's license in some rural communities, you can only get your driver's license a certain day of the week, right? Because there's just not a lot of population. But, but we, in Perquimans County, we did this 
because there was 150 people that needed injection for mental health. Just 150, that's not big numbers, but it was a big enough number that those 150 people can't get from Perquimans County, which, which is not even a, a slice of how big Blayton is geographically, right? It's a tiny little geographic county. But those people couldn't get from Perquimans to Elizabeth City, right? Just like people in Tar Heel or Clarkton can't get to Elizabeth Town. So it's the same distance, really. This mobile clinic was the answer for that. And, and frankly, I think that could be the solution here for, for those communities that you're talking about. You know, I, I grew up in Hallsboro. That's where I'm from. I played ball in Bladenboro and Tar Hill and Clarkton when those high schools were there. And so I know this territory very well. And in terms of meeting those needs, I get exactly what you're saying, Dr. Ellison. It, it is going to be critical to come up with something innovative to make that happen. Even more so when we're talking about that whole person, their health care and their behavioral health and IBD. Um, do you have any staff members that live in Blake? Right now, I think we may have two people that live here but work in Columbus County. And your, your, your administrative staff, what is the minority ratio of Asian, African American, Hispanic, and Native American? On our, on our administrative staff. Do you know that breakdown? No, you had that on the slide. I, it, was, it was the members. I don't, I don't have that breakdown. I mean, we have our staff represent our, our community. So in the, in the slide, it's along these same lines. I don't have that. As a, I don't want to give a quoted number because I don't have. So it's along, it's along these ratios right here in terms of uh, up here in the total population. So our breakdown is about the same as that. And I feel very confident in what you're saying because we recently looked at that a couple of months ago. Yeah. Do you do you have any references from the counties that you served? There were rec references about your, your business. All 26 counties would serve as a reference. You can call any of them. But you don't have references with you today. No, I didn't. I didn't bring any. I mean, we just found out about this on Friday. So okay. I didn't bring any with me, but you can you can reach out to any of those 26 counties to find out about us. Um, do you have a relationship with JCPC? Yes, our, we sit on all the collaboratives in the community, so JCPC is definitely one of those in every community. And in fact, we're doing some targeted work in a couple of our counties with tier care coordination, which is uh, supports the juvenile justice population specifically. Okay. So yes, sir. And what is your relationship with EMS and the community outreach regarding overdose? So as Joy mentioned, we purchase naloxone kits for all first responders, which includes EMS, volunteer fire departments, fire departments that are sanctioned fire departments, and law enforcement, sheriff, city police. We, we are constantly distributing naloxone kits uh, all the time, Narcan yeah. all the time. Um, we also are very involved in the Stepping Up Initiative, which is, as you know, is an initiative in counties uh, to help uh, support people with addiction. Uh, we're, we're very involved in um, EMS with regard to this. Um, Again, with the naloxone, also with the, the training we do with CIT uh, to help law enforcement. In fact, last week I met with a, an EMS group in Onslow County where piloting community paramedic, which is where which is where the the EMS acts as. We have that. You, yeah. you have community we'll paramedics as well. Yeah. Yep. So we're working with them to be more well trained to do that first responding line. Okay. If if you if you take over the services here in Bladen. I try to read your, your, your presentation here. If you take over the services, then the, the citizen will be able to receive treatments in October? We would, we would propose that we do that in October versus waiting a whole year uh, so that we can get everything implemented and stable. So, so we start now in July and then... So it would take us about 90 days to get through the process with DHHS at the state mm -hmm. level, and then October 1 would be our start date here. Okay. That's what we were proposing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you, earlier, you said where the office is located in Whitewood. Where exactly is it? So on Jefferson Street, it's down right before you get to White Marsh on the left hand side. Do you have do you have several mobile, mobile crisis providers or just one or how does that work? So um, in Columbus County, when we came in, I'll just use that as an example because it would probably be the same thing here. 
they were using Monarch. Uh, Monarch is a great provider, they're a big statewide provider, but Monarch was located in Robinson County. And just like Bladen County, Columbus is a large geographic area. And so it was real hard for them to get from Robinson County all the way out into all of the areas of Columbus. So we left Monarch there. There's still mobile crisis in their contract. They can still deliver it. And we, we did an RFP to bring in another mobile crisis provider that was based in Columbus County. That's Integrated Family Services. Um, and, and they are in our entire catchment area. We would likely do the same here if there's, if we would give Monarch the first right of refusal, but if they didn't want to locate in Bladen County, then we would seek to find a provider that would. We believe there needs to be a presence of mobile crisis. Our integrated family services that is our primary, I, mean, I say that because they're in all 26 counties, um, also participates in daily roll call with law enforcement. So they are, when they're doing the shift change, they're finding out who was a problem last night, who's got a problem today, so they can get in there and help uh, get ahead of that so law enforcement has, isn't having to do multiple responses to the same person. That mobile crisis unit also assists with the uh, sheriff's department having to sit at the hospital. So we try to divert from that, yes, absolutely. That's, that's, we got a problem with that. I just talked to a nurse, she said they had a seven day stand not too long ago. A deputy sit out here for seven days. So at Trillium we have two things. Um, one, even though we don't provide services to Commissioner Cogdale's um, point, we do have uh, an ED services team and they call every single hospital every day. We find out who's in that hospital and then we work to get them expedited out. That's children and adults, so we try very hard to keep our time of anybody in a hospital waiting very low. Uh, it's been an extremely successful way of getting people out and connected. Mobile Crisis tries to keep them from going in that door and we try to get them out once they've gone in. So we're approaching it from both sides. So uh, do you have money to reimburse to pay it for a deputy? I mean, last time I talked to Sheriff, it was $4,200 last week. And, and they still have none. And been placed. Mm -hmm. been placed now. Well, that's what I'm saying. He's placed now. Well, he's so just I not placed if he's placed. I was just wondering if there was any, is, is there any money to help reimburse? I mean, I don't, we don't get it now, but I'm just saying. No, I think the, the thing that I, the way that I would answer that is, it's my job to make sure you don't ever have to ask me that question. Okay. Right? Because I'm getting the man, woman, child, whatever, out, so that you're not having that experience. Okay. The, the, the other person, I've heard the conversations about MCOs, and the state is looking at, they don't really want all these MCOs. They want them to go away. They say they won't come down to at least five. That's what they were talking about. Statements like that five insurance companies. And I'm looking at you guys being one of the biggest service providers of all of it. And the first I'm asking is, is, is MCOs, now you got to answer the not. Are y'all positioning y'all set to be one of the five? Absolutely. I know right now Warren County, Halifax County, and all these counties are on the table right now for July 1st, too. Yes, sir. And I'm trying to figure out who's diving at what <laughs> and where is it going. And, and size, I, size will matter, population will matter. And I'm saying that when you keep diving up, and I'm looking at 1.3, how many is it, 1.3 million or something? It's 1.5 for the total population. Yeah, we just represent 32. About 30 of that population. I'm just trying to figure out. The smaller won't make it. Small just, numbers won't make just, it I'm just financially. At where you at at the table when you, that's some of the kickback that's going with the other news being downsized. And, you know, people being represented in large packs. And then when you leave that concentration, uh, relationship is kind of diminishing off. Yep. So this governing structure that we have formed for the other 26 counties, to your point, uh, levels that playing field. So you have a big county like New Hanover is equal to a small county like Jones in the southern region. They're equal. 
Um, we, this structure was developed by the Trillium Board that was originally 24 counties. Uh, and those counties felt like this was the way to level the playing field between really big and really small counties so everybody got heard equally. To your point. You only got 26 counties and only 100, so you're looking good, right? Better than some. You know, you're going to do the math. You know, so you <laughs> looking pretty good. So you mentioned, I got a little bit of but so you mentioned Monarch. Yes, sir. Monarch's in Blank County. Are they? But They're not doing the job. What, what, are, what are they supposed to be doing? I asked that the other day. I mean, what, what are they supposed to be doing? Are they in a real crisis? Is that the They're supposed to be. Yeah. So. Well, you know. I, I just, I just wanted you talking about if, if, if you're lucky enough that we select you. That, that's where you got. What place you got to start right there? So yes, sir. So we would start by mystery shopping them like we were a consumer to find out what they're doing, and they know this about us. Um, that's what we did in Columbus, right? And then we act on it. We will act on it. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Let me say thank you and thank Trina yes, for taking the time out of your schedule to make this presentation. Absolutely. And, uh, We'll, we'll, we'll decide what we're going to do shortly. Okay. Thank so you again so much for that opportunity. Thank you.